<laughs> Hold on a second, I've lost my lighting and I need to turn it down a bit. How about that? I even got a haircut. Beautiful. <laughs> right, welcome everybody. Buckle up on the edge of your seats. Brace yourself as I have the number one change agent around the world to grow the game of tennis, which is Javier Polonque in Miami. What's your manifesto for growth, Javier? What's the problem? What's the solution? First of all, good morning <clears throat> or good afternoon, uh, wherever you are listening to me. I appreciate this moment and opportunity, obviously, to put my views. My manifesto is this. Tennis is a sport that is so absolutely marvelous to learn that we don't have enough people learning it and playing it all over the world. So it could actually benefit society as a whole much better. For example, let's say we have any postal code in England or I, in, in Australia, I would imagine is the same thing. They have postal codes in the US, they have zip codes. You know what I would like? I would like to have identified, let's say 200 kids that we are bringing up with the proper values, discipline, moral courage, ambition that comes through training through the tennis system, not to be champions of Australia, not to be champions of the US Open, not to be champions of Wimbledon. That's somebody else's dream. The dream of responsible administrators of such a wonderful sport and the objective has to be what values does the sport garner and collate? So when the people go through this system, they actually populate their zip codes wherever they are, but since they are actually good people, good citizens, excellent kids, excellent professors, excellent teachers, excellent whatever. When you are at a supermarket in London, Harrods, I want, this is what I want for every place in the world. The supermarket wants to hire, the supermarket manager wants to hire uh, kids to work their first job. When they see the application and the kid writes there, tennis player, I want the manager of that supermarket to read that and understand. He's not going to ask, what is the UTR ranking of the player? Of course, he's not going to ask that. What he's going to say is, I know what tennis does to people. I know what tennis works. They work on values, discipline, order, management, uh, risk taking. These are wonderful kids. That is the manifesto to make a better society through the tennis, through all the nuggets that tennis brings. So everybody knows the value of tennis. So when you are a kid and a parent, where do I put my kids? Imagine this, think of this, let's dream a little bit. You know the kids are gonna be picked first for jobs. You know the kids are gonna be, that's it. This is what the sport has to do to benefit society. Now I'll tell you something that I tell everybody in my gigs, in my consulting work. I lived and worked in 70 countries, write that down, seven, zero. That is so many countries, it's ridiculous. But here's what I've learned. If you're an Australian, that's just an idea. If you're a British guy, that's also just an idea. I'm from Bolivia, but I live in America. That's also just an idea. We're just good people, bad people. Lazy people, not lazy people. Educated people, not educated people. Literate people, illiterate people. I want people to be tennis people. Why? All of us are of a certain age. We know tennis and the value it does. This is why we spend our time if it, with it. We need more tennis people. So to summarize, the manifesto is we need to populate our societies all over the world, nationless under an umbrella, which is the tennis nation, the tennis republic. This is what we need. Just outstanding. I need to bottle you and... <laughs> Put you around the world in 70 countries and I know you're focused on kids but the same thing is for any age and any ability you've lost well, your job at 45 you lost your industry what do you do that's right if you're a tennis player you can pivot and go again 
Well, there's, there's a, a very important point. I say kids because I, I imagine most of the audience is coaches and therefore I'm assuming maybe incorrectly that mostly they coach kids. However, however, there's a, there's the, the millennial population is humongous. The largest consumer population on this earth. And guess what? I don't know the trends in particular in Australia, but I'll speak for America and I don't think it's any different in England or Australia. They have been the least exposed people to tennis. And this is a fact, which means there is an enormous market to develop the sport among these people. And these people are the parents of youngsters and the parents of the future kids to be. So it is really important that they understand, why would I choose tennis? Let's think about that question for a moment. Your parent, right? Okay, so what am I gonna choose? And let's say you're an average parent. Let's not say you're the CEO of a company so you can pay a coach here, a coach there, travel, and forget that. That is an outlier. Those are the minuscule amount of people. And usually those people don't produce champions because you cannot buy a championship. All the players that we watch in TV are mostly poor kids who have become good at something for a multitude of reasons. So money, if you have a lot of money, no, you won't be a champion. You have to have the most important trait in order to be a champion. And let's not just say champion. Again, I repeat myself. I don't want him to be or she to be the champion of Australia or I don't. They're champions of their life. They have to be champions of their life. The way to be a champion of your life is to go somewhere where somebody can teach you the values, the key pillars of how do you become a champion of your life? If you're a little overweight, you're not going to win anything. So the ambition cannot be to win Wimbledon. The ambition has to be, I want to reach to my level of incompetence. Help me. But you know what? Even though I may be a lousy tennis player, which I am, by the way, I love the sport. I want to practice every day. I want to sweat. I want to work out. And the values that have taken me here have made me a successful person in the eyes of some, maybe a not so successful person in the eyes of the other. It doesn't matter. We have an obligation as, let's call it senior leaders, to create a foundation. And when you have a house, when you build a house, you lay out the foundation, hopefully the first foundation is your Christian or your Christian's beliefs, hopefully, or your religious belief or your spiritual belief, because that is forever, right? But the next pillars are the values that you have. So when things happen, you know the kids are actual, or the kids or young adults or whoever you're bringing there, you know they're well prepared to work anything out. This is how you make the sport help society and the kids help themselves. And this is how you grow the sport. You're going to grow the sport not because there's an Australian star. You're not going to grow the sport because there's a British star or an American star. This is absurd. People nowadays could care less of where you come from. They want to perceive values. Let's go back to the supermarket manager example. He's gonna hire a few kids that are gonna help pack. The mission of the associations and federations has to be how to clearly identify. So people in hiring positions for their first job know that a tennis kid is coming and they immediately hire this kid. Let me change tack and get into, which is obviously a contentious subject about centralized control, trickle down systems versus decentralized passion bottom up. How can they work together to grow the game for the benefit of the game? And talk about entertainment versus the sport. Okay, let me give you an example. The big federations are actually like government, right? It's the same thing. So do you think the Australian government can build a car? No chance. Do you think they can build, the UK government can build a car? Uh, they have a hard time figuring out, you know, how to trade with Ireland and they're going to figure out how to build a car. It's not possible. It is a guy, it is a mechanic somewhere, Mr. Ford, who, or somebody like that, that is, has the ability, the wits, 
and the will and the heart to build something. And if you translate that into the tennis world, it is the local coaches. It is the best person who can have an idea on how to grow the game is the person who's invested in the court eight or nine or 10 hours that can understand the dynamics. But here's the problem with these people. These people are fantastic people. They can be the catalyst for change. They don't have the time or the money or the wherewithal to be able to create programs and multiply their things because they're fighting their little competition somewhere in their corner of the world. This is when the federations have to come and understand what is it that they deliver. Let's talk about the four Grand Slam nations. If you would talk about the four Grand Slam nations, they have something wonderful called an entertainment event. But to put a good entertainment, here's what you need. Clean bathrooms. This is the most important thing. Good ample parking. Great. Great food. Great. Good drinks. Yep. Good looking serving staff, because that would be nice. In America, it's called eye candy, right? Oh, good looking people, because most of the people that can afford things are older, right? Okay. And then the players who play. Okay. Uh, but guess, let's think, let's think for a moment in a very conspicuous way. Uh, do you think the UK is trying to create a great scotch so they could entertain people with a great scotch made in the USA? No. Do you think the people in the UK are trying to build some fabulous bread? No. This is what the federations spend countless millions of dollars trying to develop their own star to a world that could care less where the star comes from because they look at what does this star bring that is so beautiful and romantic. They don't look at where they come from. In fact, they probably couldn't even point where Serbia is in a map. And so they, these federations spend millions and millions and millions of dollars trying to build a champion and they can't. Case of Australia, the number one male player is a guy from Spain. And the reason he chose Spain is because his mother happens to be from Australia. That's just happenstance. And so in Spain, he was trying to, nobody gave him any money because the Spanish Federation has no money. Australia came and said, we'll pay for everything you want. And so now he's an Australian representing Australia. Now there's no problem putting hundreds of millions of dollars collectively between the four Grand Slam nations to try to develop a star, which is the equivalent of try to develop scotch in Australia or in America. Why? The British do it better than anybody. We let them do that. We just, just entertain that product. And so how do you solve the problems? Here, what I'm trying to say is you're concentrating all this wealth, trying to develop something that nobody values, yet you're ignoring something that everybody values and everybody wants, which is the community tennis part of it. And let's not forget, the community tennis part of it, actually, you're actually building in your own self-interest the future fans of the sport. This is what you need to do. So if you just compare how much money is spent in community tennis versus how much money is spent in uh, trying to develop a player, it tells you one thing. It is absolutely ridiculous. So what's the solution? The solution is, of course, to decentralize and split the two. I'm, I'm sure the Australian Open is a wonderful event, as is Wimbledon, as is the US Open, as is Roland Garros. But that's one part of the business, and that is Please, people, make sure that the entertainment is beautiful. Make sure you have stars from countries we can't even point them in a map. Usually the champ is going to be from some country that nobody knows where it's at. That should be a requirement, actually, when you go in. Can you name where is Serbia and put it in a map? And they can't, but that's another and They thing. don't have Grand Slams. These people that win Grand Slams of not. generally of not. don't have Grand Slams in their country. Correct. Correct. And so that's one thing. Then, then the other thing, which is clean bathrooms, great food, great service, good looking people. Okay, great. That entertains people for two weeks. And let's make sure we understand these two weeks. The first week is fabulous because there are people are fighting for their lives and you see that fight. It's almost like going back to Rome times and putting a few people fight against the lion. It's like, that is entertaining. After that, it's really boring because you know who actually is gonna win and it's boring. Now they're not fighting for their lives. Now they're fighting for skill. And so here is really, really important to understand this. <clears throat> Out of the 52 weeks, only one is entertaining, really. The rest is like, nobody cares, nobody goes. It's okay, I mean, I saw the final. Okay, so what tennis needs is to split between the entertainment world and the tennis world. The entertainment world uses tennis wonderfully. Great, keep it like that and make sure you focus on that. 
but we need to grow community tennis and we need to give the coaches all over the world the ability, the tools. We have to bring the world to them so they understand how they can bring value and go back to what I said before. What do they do that actually resonates with society in general that actually makes people attractive and want to default to the sport? So they need our help. And here's the key thing to understand. If we think we need of a government, let me tell you my personal American point of view. Governments are useless. The power is within us to make the right decisions. We need to comprehend this. And now we have the tools like we have right now. I'm in Miami, you're in the UK, and people in Australia are going to look at us and listen to us. This is fantastic. With this same power, we can self-organize to self-grow, to be independent and self-dependent because we have to have a bigger mission than to teach a few lessons. And here's our mission, and here's the mission for this group. Remember, we're talking about not the entertainment part. The mission of the entertainment part is to entertain and have clean bathrooms. That's it. That's all there is to it. And make a shed load of money. Of course. And of course, that money has to be used and put to use, and that money has to grow. That money has to grow and has to grow for the benefit of society. That's why they are a nonprofit. And the mission for the community tennis has to be to empower themselves and to make sure after a day's worth of work, to think this, are we preparing kids and young adults to be the absolutely most valuable people in our society? And the answer has to be unequivocally, yes, sir. And if parents knew that and they had a choice, shall I take Johnny to soccer or, or tennis? I'll take him to tennis, I'll show him to tennis. 100%. It is not even a choice because let's think about it. Both parents work in most countries. They don't have time. And the time they have with their kids, do you think they're gonna try to instill all this or they gotta choose instill and be a super, super parent or actually just be a dad and try to have a relationship with the kids. It's not a hard choice, but here's how we suffer. Society suffers. The thinking has to be big. The thinking has to be progressive. The thinking has to be borderless. The thinking has to be ambitious. The thinking has to be out of this world. In Spain, in COVID, tennis was deemed an essential activity. So they all played outside. It was an essential activity. Most parts around the world, tennis courts inside and out were shut. Right. So talk a little bit then about trickle down, because the people at the bottom have the inspiration, the passion, the innovation to make things happen. But what they lack is replication and they lack distribution and they look they lack cash. Talk a bit about that, because okay. that's where the government can play a fantastic role. Yeah. Right. Well, this is the thing. The people that run the government, let's call the federations, they know this, but they also don't know what to do. They also don't know what to do. I am certain there's a whole bunch of really, really good people working at these federations, but they don't have the idea. What do we do? What do we do? And By so, definition, because but, if you did, you'd be doing it, and those that are right. doing it don't want a job. Correct. And so they are incorrectly incorrectly taking a stand and making decisions that they know in their hearts are the wrong decisions. And so what needs to happen is a tete a tete for those who don't speak French, a face-to-face -face talk that is open in America. I'll tell you about, I'll speak about America. The USDA has these meetings, they record them and they don't allow any questions. Okay, so that's more reminiscent of Cuba to me, right? It's China. Cuba. Okay, China, uh, we call what we need to do is open it up, have discussions, and you have to have the courage to be criticized. Because if you don't have this moral courage, then how can you possibly allocate in good 
sense, the resources that the people need. So you could actually work together. What I'm trying to suggest is as follows. There has to be a split between the entertainment and the community tennis. And community tennis has to be held accountable, but with the tools that come from the tennis federations. Now, in the Australia case, Craig Tiley can't be the boss of making sure we have a great entertainment and clean bathrooms and grow tennis in somewhere in Australia. That's ridiculous. There's got to be an appointed person who has this mission, who reports to the community, because I am a shareholder of tennis in the world, but I don't have a voice. Now, I am outspoken, loud, and I travel all over the world all the time. So I can see things, and my opinion counts. People may not like my opinion, and I respect that, but no, people can't say that my opinion doesn't count. So all those other coaches that are sitting it somewhere or working all day long, they can't go anywhere. They're stuck. We need to bring the help to them. So we need to have a big vision to change. And why should we change for the Federation? Why should we do it? because it is the only way to bring new fans that the sport needs, number one. Number two, you gotta do it in your own self-interest, meaning the Federation, and we want Tennis Australia to succeed forever, but we need allocation of resources in a way that actually allows something bigger than a tournament that lasts for two weeks, of which only one week is interesting. And, here's and what it, it is, is their mandate. Nest for not for profit is their number one mandate. Grow the game. Correct. But and, and here's what what needs to be done. What needs to be done is we need to think how do we make society better through tennis. This is the point. And so what we need to do, and coaches need to understand, is the power is within them, and they got to speak out. They got to speak out because those people in power who look the other way or pretend they don't hear, they know exactly that that's the right thing to do. And they have no way of doing it. And this is a way to do it. So how can we create a cooperative for Tennis Republic? Because that's what you're aiming towards, I would think, a cooperative. Correct. Correct. Well, we have to have enough people in enough parts of the world where they actually understand and share this mission. Uh, I believe that we are all tennis players at hand. I don't know if it happens to you, but whenever I'm in the airport and I'm in the airport often, if I see somebody with a tennis bag or a tennis racket, regardless of their age, I feel like going up to them and saying, oh, something, I don't know hello, what do you play? Or that racket sucks or whatever. I mean, this is what I feel. This is no different than you being in some place foreign and you hear a British accent and you somehow, I would imagine, feel like saying, oh, hello, I'm from, I'm Mark from the UK. Where are you from? Right? It, me the same, likewise, you know, we don't know. So this is the whole thing. So how do we do it? Well, we have the technology. We have to have, we have the technology so it's easy to actually unite, number one. Number two, we have to have the belief that the power is within us so we actually actively try to connect with people like you, Mark, with people like me, with people at the winning summit or between the white lines because these people can be catalysts and no, nothing that is done is easily done. You can't think that. You gotta work for it to happen. And you gotta make sure you improve that forehand. So you could, you're not gonna be good at that forehand if you take three shots, you gotta take a hundred. You wanna be really good, you gotta take a thousand. And so you gotta be able to do this and you have to have one thing, the courage to speak your mind. I have the courage to speak my mind. I am, I'm sure, hated by some people, but at the same time, loved and admired by others. And I get letters from people who are supposed to not like me, and they say to me, please don't say that I like what you say, but I really love what you say. And these are people in high places. Please, please, please don't say my name. Of course, I will never say their name, but the fact is this. The sport is worth saving. The sport is worth preserving. And when we are near our deathbed or near our tombstone, wouldn't we all, tennis people, tennis citizens, want to know that we left a few young people with the same values and principles so their generation is better than ours? I don't know about you, but 
That's all I want to do. Awesome. So Tennis Republic should have a passport. Yes. And in the passport, it should say, my name is Tennis. Correct. Correct. This is exactly how it has to work. So when we go, when I go to England and I meet you, let's say I didn't meet you. I don't know you. I go to the Tennis Republic website and I go, hey, I would like to play tennis. I'm in this certain zip code. You want to play? And not feel, I mean, if we are like-minded people, you would say, sure, let's go play. So we play, we talk, we have sticky toffee pudding and some nice English tea. And if you come to Miami, I will take you to a Cuban place and make sure you have an espresso, a Cuban espresso. So you, when you go back home, you have stories to make people envious, jealous of, and laugh, and so will I. And this is how you grow the sport by uniting like-minded people and making sure that the sport delivers not a champion, not a forehand, not a backhand. Actually, the values that society needs today more than ever. It needs good people. There is simply not enough of them and there's no school for this. Beautiful. Right, so let's see if Between the White Lines Australia can be the catalyst for Tennis Republic. Watch this space. Miracles can happen. Javier Palonque, I never get tired of listening to you. Thank you so much for your contributions. Well, thank you for your time. And to anybody listening, remember this. And this is something that I do with my kids when we finish the court. I go like this to my heart. I pound it two times and I show a fist. That means whatever you do, do it with your heart. And if you're going to die, do with your heart. Peace. This will not be the last, Javier. <laughs> this will care. not be the last. All right. Thank you. Thank you.